Pastor James Monahan would like to thank you for listening to this message from City Life Church in Orange County, California. Pastor James and City Life Church are committed to the gospel of grace and celebrating Jesus and his finished work. Well, um, this morning I want to uh, spend some time talking to you about uh, something that's um, one of my favorite scriptures, actually. And uh, it's, it's one that really begins to challenge me. Have you ever come to certain portions of scripture that really... Uh, speak to you in a way that demand that you uh, you kind of perk up, you listen up, you're 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 like a whoa, okay, yes, Lord, I I, I hear you, you know, and uh, this is one of those scriptures to me. It's a prophetic scripture. It's something that I feed on quite a lot, and uh, that I take as a promise to me, uh, a promise to our churches in Joburg and in the OC here, and I'm very encouraged to uh, share with you this morning. Uh, the thought of increase. Come on, say increase. Come on, turn to your neighbor this morning and say it's time to increase. Yeah, that's right. It's not time for decrease. It's time for increase. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us that the harvest field is white unto harvest and it's ready to be harvested. But it says that the laborers are few. Um, in other words, it's saying that you'll see stuff around you that looks like you can go ahead and do it. But God is saying, you're going to need my help. And that's why it says, so pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into his harvest. And I believe that this is a, this is, we're going to enter a time of great harvest. We're going to enter a time of increase. We're going to enter a time of more. Um, even as our church is about three months old um, and God has uh, birthed something new, uh, we're still trying to figure out in God, you know, what our identity is within this particular part of the world as far as what God is telling us to be and to say. We know our message. We know kind of uh, 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 the parameters of what God is calling us to. It's getting clearer and clearer. But I want to talk to you this morning about how God increases things and uh, how God wants to increase you, how God wants to enlarge your territory and um, so I'm believing, God, that uh, He'll speak to you beyond your intellect. And this morning will be a prophetic moment for you where you will connect with the very heart of God. And it won't just be intellectual knowledge or some kind of information, but that there is going to be something that is going to be imparted into your spirit. And that's going to begin to work on you on the inside. And before you know it, throughout the course of the week, you're beginning to experience the outworking of what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you. Hallelujah. Rather than you just making a decision this morning, I'm going to screw up my will. I'm going to be a better person. And I'm going to do what Pastor James says because it's a good word. No, come on. Let's believe for greater things than that. Hallelujah. Let's believe, God, that this isn't just going to be a time where you get to impart and implement the truth. No, let's believe that God, through His Spirit, is going to empower you to do things that you've never done before in Jesus' name. How many would rather live that way than just living through the power of your own will? Come on, I want to live by the Spirit of God that empowers me to pray in a different way, to see in a different way, to believe in a different way, to, 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 to see God move in great ways and in, in through my life. Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 2 through 3, it says, Enlarge the place of your tent. Some versions say dwelling. Enlarge the place of your of your dwelling or tent. Paul uses the word tent when it comes to your physical being or your physical body. And he says that one day we're going to have to take off this tent, that we are dwelling in the tent, that we're just sojourners in this kind of a tent. Okay, so this tent thought, it's a New Testament thought, it's a new covenant thought, and it's an old covenant thought as well. So uh, it says that God wants us to enlarge. Come on, say enlarge. That's right. God wants us to enlarge the place of our tent or our dwelling. And it goes on to say how this tent is constructed and how through each aspect, three different aspects of this tent and its, and its formation and its basic parts, how each one of those is to be affected. The first one, it says, and let them stretch out, what? 
the curtains. That's the one part of the tent, is that every tent has curtains, and those curtains are to be stretched out. They're to be put under pressure in a way. I try to get a, a little bit of a stretching experience going on here with this tent. That is not a bra strap. I just don't want you to think that. That, my friend, is a tent and a hook. Hallelujah. Just for those who are wondering, what the heck is that? Just clear that up. Now I'll put a bad thought in your mind. Right. Okay. Sorry, Lord. All right. Do not spare, it says. It says that we're to stretch out our curtains of our dwellings. And it says, don't spare. Don't have an attitude of sparing. Don't have an attitude of holding back to wait and see. Don't have a wait and see attitude. It says, don't spare, but lengthen your cords. That's the other part of, uh, of the tent's construction. It's got curtains. It's got cords. And then it goes on to say, strengthen your stakes. It's got stakes. In other words, it's got a, a, a tent peg that goes into the ground. For you shall expand to the right and to the left. Come on, how many of you are taking this word for yourself today? I'm not talking about expanding in your waistline. I'm talking about expanding in your influence. Can I hear an amen? expanding in your ability to, 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 to take the gospel of grace to other people, expanding in your heart to say, God, use me in mightier ways, expanding in your ability to go beyond your ability, expanding in, in, in your uh, understanding of who Jesus is and His finished work, expansion in uh, able to influence and help and affect the lives of those that are in your metron or your sphere of influence. Hallelujah. For you shall expand to the right and the left and your descendants, hallelujah, your children, your spiritual children will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Someone recently just asked us, why do we call ourselves City Life Church? What, what inspired that particular thing? Well, about, I'd say, 18 years ago, Ginny and I were around a kitchen table at our in-laws' house, and uh, we knew we were called to plant a church, and so we went through several different, different aspects. But um, I believe that God moves and wants to move and loves very much uh, cities. And, kind of, and, and the reason why He loves cities is because that's where His image dwells more than anywhere else in rural areas and in small areas, but God is a God of cities. He has a city. And, and, and Abraham, the father of our faith, went out looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. God is a God of cities. We see God in the Old Testament loving cities and judging cities. God is a God who sees that that's where the seed of power is through cities. He, he invented cities. City, the city on a hill. The city that cannot be hidden. Mount Zion. We see the city, the God of cities. Cities. There's a cityology in our spirit. When we think about cities, we see God loves cities. God cares about cities. There's a city of refuge in the Bible where those who were accused could run and find a safe haven. For, uh, there's a, a city in heaven, hallelujah. The city of God, hallelujah. Come on. God is a God of cities. So when we look at why we're called city life, it's because God loves cities. God wants to save cities. God wants to turn the city upside down. Hallelujah. Like we see in the book of Acts, uh, when Jesus is being revealed to His church, letters are written to cities. The city of Galatia, the city of Thessalonia, the city of Corinth, the city of Philippi, and so on. We see God is a God of cities. Can I hear an Amen. And I'm glad we live in one of the greatest cities on the earth. Hallelujah. Here in Orange County. Can I hear an amen, somebody? We live in a great city. I tell you what, I'm blessed. Aren't you blessed that you were not born into uh, uh, some kind of a slum somewhere in the armpit of a nation not to be mentioned uh, where you were somehow deprived of opportunity? Uh, come on, you didn't choose where you were born. Uh, God predestined it. Uh, you didn't choose your passport or your nationality. God put you in a family and that family, hallelujah, has been ordained by God even even though it may be broken, and even though they went through a divorce, uh, or even though you were abandoned and put into a foster family, God knew beforehand what would happen concerning you, uh, and He wants to make all things work together for the good. 
And so God uh, is not uh, surprised uh, by where you were born. No, He ordained it. Hallelujah. Do you realize that we have the epistles of Paul written in the hand of Paul because he was a Roman citizen, not just a Jew, and he was able to flee Jewish persecution and was in, uh, put under uh, house arrest as a Roman citizen so that he could write the epistles? Uh, you got to know that it's important what passport you hold. Hallelujah. It's important. You're, you're not accidentally here. Even if you were born in some other place and ended up here, God has ordered the steps of the righteous and you are here by divine design. Amen. You are not a mistake on the way to happen. Hallelujah. No, you are meant to be where you are. You are part of God's plan. And so the city life church kind of thing is we knew we weren't called to be a fellowship. We weren't just called to be a community. We weren't just called to be city life. No, we were called to be a church, the ecclesia, the called out special ones of God, because that is what Jesus is building, is building a church. So we didn't want to negate that word from our name. So we are church. Hallelujah. Okay. Why life? Well, because when Jesus came, He said that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Can I hear an amen? Not just life like the earthly life. No, that word life, when it talks about I can that you might have life, that word life is zoe, which is the life of God, the God kind of life, the higher life of God, the better life of God. And God's called us as new creations to live a life in a city as a church to do great things for Him. And that's why I want to talk to you this morning is that God hasn't got you at City Life Church so that you can warm a teal chair. Hallelujah. God's plan for you is not so that you can sit and uh, partake and enjoy our services and be a religious service provided to you. And we are not consumers like locusts. Hallelujah. Can I hear an amen? Somebody. We are not consumers only. No, we are those who, yes, we taste and see. But once we've seen, we begin to do that which God has shown us. We taste, we see, we do. God has called us to, come on, to belong. And once we belong, we then can believe. And once we've started to believe, we then are able to become what Jesus has called us to become and as a result of that becoming, our behavior starts to change. We don't want to remain infants. We want to grow up in God. And anybody who grows up and becomes mature begins to reproduce. Hallelujah. There's a fruitfulness that God has for all of us. And that part of that fruitfulness has to do with this Isaiah scripture where it talks about enlargement. Number one, enlarge. Let's take that word enlarge. That word enlarge. To increase the size of our sphere of influence, that word sphere of influence in the Greek is the word metron. And it says we must recognize that everyone has a God-given sphere. Come on, you've got a God-given sphere. Jesus has given City Life Church a sphere which includes Joburg, and this was uh, meant to say Orange County. And uh, God has given us a certain sphere, a certain metron. And you'll find this thought actually in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And it says, We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us. There is an appointed sphere that God has given to you, your family and friends, the place where you work, for other people, it may be slightly larger based on what they do for a living. Uh, your Facebook page doesn't necessarily mean your sphere of influence. Hallelujah. All the people that follow you may not be in your metron. You'll find out who's in your metron by who clicks like and who supports your thoughts and is being discipled by you through those, those comments and through those moments. You can have 4,000 followers, but really... You've only got 40 people in your sphere of influence. You hear what I'm saying? So it says, and we, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits, hallelujah. You know what? We often hear about the unlimited and the things that are, you know, hey, don't put God in a box. And, you know, hey, think out of the box. No, I say to you that there are limits within your sphere. There are boundaries. There are borders. There are lines. 
that have fallen even unto David when he writes it in Psalms, and the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. He knew there were boundary lines for him. There are boundary lines within your sphere of influence. I can't just decide to rock up in Pakistan or in Kenya or in some other place in the world and increase my sphere of influence. No, God is the one who gives the sphere of influence. One says, I'm of Paul, and one says, I'm of Apollos. And, and, and God says, hey, let's do away with I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. But it's God who gives the increase. So the glory is not to go to man, but man has been given a metron. Man has been given a sphere. Allison, you've got a sphere of influence in your uh, friendships right now. Come on, Bill, you've got some influence Pastor Benny's got influence as a large influence all over the place. We've got influence as a church here and in Johannesburg. Okay, so we got to understand that there is a sphere of influence that God wants to enlarge. It's God who enlarges your sphere. You can't decide to take matters into your own hands and say, I'm going to enlarge my sphere. I want to be famous. I want to be great. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to just write this book so I can enlarge my sphere. No, God gives you the gift. God gives you the grace. God gives you the wisdom. God gives you the ability, the prophetic eyes to see what He's called you to do. And then He gives you the grace to do it in due season and at the right time. We can't just decide that the world is our oyster and I can make my life. I can make my way. I am the captain of my own ship. I am the Lord of my own destiny. I say no to that. Hallelujah. For it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by Christ and by His His love that He has for me. Come on. I, I know that I can't just decide to sail my ship into uncharted waters and just say, this is my, the whole world is my, is my oyster. I say no in Jesus' name. No, there are boundary lines that have been set out for you. And uh, it's called the will of God. Hallelujah. It's called the destiny of God. It's called the plan of God. It's called the parameters of His will for your life. And it's not to limit you in a sense of uh, restriction and say, oh, you've just got a small little lot of land. No, it's to enable you to be faithful with a knowable area. You see, when you think it's all yours, you can't do anything with the whole world, but you can do something in your backyard. And it's when the lie that comes that says it's all mine, that makes us not faithful with the thing that's actually in our hand. And we begin to despise what's in our hand by comparison to the greatness of it's all mine. So we often hear messages, and Ginny and I have a pet peeve about this. You're going to be great one day, you know. God says you're going to be great. And what does the word great mean? Well, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? He's a servant of all. Most people, when they think of greatness, they think about a platform, they think about shining lights, think about fame, they think about mega influence, they think about mega finances, they think about all of these things. Let me tell you what greatness is as far as God is concerned, is being faithful with the metron and the sphere that He's placed you in to serve those people with what agenda? With the gospel of grace, to share that with them, to love them, to care for them, to lift them up, to pray for them, to encourage them, to bring them to the house of God. This is what it means to know your sphere and to be faithful with your own sphere of influence by the grace of God. The grace of God extends within all the parameters of your, your own sphere, which has some limits to it. It goes from one corner to the other corner and it begins to rise and fill that space with great grace in Jesus' name. When we step out of our sphere, we find that you know, it gets a little bit more human. It gets a little bit more difficult because we start to do things that, you know, are really based on ourselves. So what I want to do this morning is I want to help you understand, number one, that there is a sphere. But number two, God's heart is to enlarge it. Hallelujah. God's heart is to enlarge that sphere that you're in right now. So why don't you... Uh, Think about your sphere. Think about what that is. Psalm 16.5 says, The Lord is my inheritance and my cup. You are the one who, dis who determines my destiny. Your boundary lines mark out pleasant places for me. Indeed, my inheritance is something beautiful. 
Number two, this thought here says, stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. To be stretched personally and as a church means to feel the tension between two or more points. To be committed to increase in order to undergo the stretching process. When you're committed to increase, it means you're committed to being stretched. You can't say, oh God, I want to be increased. Oh God, I want to be enlarged. Oh God, I want more for my life without saying, but God, I want you to stretch me. Ask any woman that's had a baby what it means to have increase in her family. Before you can have increase in your family and enlargement, there is a stretching. Hallelujah. And there are creams and oils that go with that stretching. Well, you get to rub your tummy with some oil, hoping to God and praying that no stretch marks will come near you in Jesus' mighty name. But every stretch mark, hallelujah, is a sign of increase, a sign of fruitfulness, and a sign of enlargement. Hallelujah. So rather than despising the lines on your belly, hallelujah, they remind us as husbands and as wives, what? That God has made us fruitful and caused us to enlarge. Can I hear an amen, somebody? So what the world despises, God embraces and rejoices in because enlargement means stretching. And if you want to increase in God, in your capacity to, to uh, uh, carry the glory of God, carry the person of Jesus, carry uh, a weightiness in the anointing of God, there is a stretching that you will be put into. And often that stretching is not just spiritual, it is both financial, it is also emotional, it's physical, it's mental, it's relational. Come on, it's a stretching that includes all aspects of our lives. A lot of the times we don't like to be stretched because it's uncomfortable. It's not something that we naturally find ourselves running towards saying, oh, just stretch me out. Come on, that's awesome. I remember going for a Thai massage once. And I thought, oh, this is going to be nice. I'll, you know, get to have a relaxing, uh, a relaxing massage after 30 hours of travel in the airplane. And hallelujah. Oh, my word, was I wrong. I had elbows, knees. I had all kinds of stuff going into my back. I started whimpering. I didn't, you know, when they say to you, just tell me if the pressure is okay. Okay, they don't quite say it like that. They say it with a Thai accent. Pressure okay? Pressure okay? And so I was like uh, wanting not to wuss out and say, no, ease up, you know. So I'm, I'm lying down on the pillow and tears are coming out of my eyes. And I'm, uh, you okay, sir? Are you, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Oh, as she grinds away. And then she starts to, pull on my limbs and twist them in ways I didn't know they could go. She said, this is very good for you. Good for circulation. <laughs> I wasn't feeling so good about all of that contorting and twisting and stuff. But one thing I do know is that when God gets a hold of us and we say yes to enlargement, that means we're saying yes to stretching and as we say yes to stretching, he begins to rub the oil of anointing into every area of your life so God can stretch you. He can grow your faith. Uh, he can stretch you. He can grow your ability to, uh, to endure things that you never thought you could endure. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord, the one who raised Christ Jesus out of the grave, is the one that dwells inside of you and enables you to endure. Hallelujah. So stretching out those curtains of your dwelling is a big part of enlargement. The third thought here is that of, a, of, a, of lengthening your cords and do not spare. That, that do not spare speaks to this very clearly. It doesn't say just lengthen your cords. It added on do not spare. The reason why when it comes to giving out more of that cordage, more of that thing that supports your life and holds you up more and more and more 
is there is sometimes an unwillingness in our spirit or in our mind or in our heart to say, but God, I've already given you rope to work with. Why do you want more? Ask me how I know this feeling. I already gave out 15 years of rope and a great church in South Africa. God, why do you want me to go to the other side of the world and give out more rope? Hear what I'm saying? But just when you think you've arrived at the place where you could retire, God says, no, it's time to refire. And right now I'm going to demand that you give me more rope to work with so I can stretch you out and enlarge you and increase your sphere of influence. It requires uh, more than a sense of do not spare. You know, that sense of Okay, I'll wait and see how this goes, kind of. Let's take a measured step, uh, a step that is responsible. Let me tell you something, people. The more you walk with God, the more irresponsible He wants you to become in many areas of your life. I'm telling you that. Why? Because the more irresponsible, as far as human means, I tell you, he says, yes, be irresponsible that you may become dependent on me, not dependent on your responsibility. Being a reasonable, responsible adult. God's never really spoken to me that way before. He's always asked me to be unreasonable and irresponsible. Isn't that right, Jenny? A lot of the time, it's been like, okay, well, you don't have any money, get married. It's okay, I'll deal with it. Okay, you want to start a church, but you don't have any money. Don't worry. I'll help you to do it. Okay, you want to have kids, but you don't know how to parent. It's okay. Have a kid. I'll teach you how to parent. Come on. You know that whole taste and see thing? Yeah. God says, you go first. I'll back you up. Not, hey, God, you move and then I'll go. No, 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 no. Never works that way. You move. God says, you move and I'll back you. And these signs will follow those who believe. Not these who believe will follow these signs. And then we got a church full of that. Hey, I'll follow the signs. We follow the signs. Wherever the signs go is where I'm going. No, and these signs will follow you in Jesus' name. It's not the other way around. Signs that are going to follow your life. But first of all, we have to have a do not spare spirit. One who says, but God, I've given, do you know how much I've given? I've been counting. See, when we start counting, that's when there's a problem. When you start to count, but God, I've moved this many times in my life. But God, I, I, I've just started really doing well in this career. But God, I, 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 I've, you know what? I'm, I've given so much, but God, you know I want this thing. And if I say yes to you, I'm going to have to say no to this. And I really don't want to say no to this because I've been saying yes to you all this time. Can I not just have this? And the Lord says, I love you too much to let you have that because I'm going to release that thing from your life so that you can not spare. And as you don't spare, you're going to begin to see me do something that's a lot bigger than this little thing you want to hold on to. That's how God works. To lengthen generously, not holding back or being conservative, not hesitant or cautious, but boldly, lavishly, generously, give out of ourselves, to, give ourselves to lengthening our cause, to extending our reach for the cause of Christ. But God, I don't want to have anybody else in my home. My home is chaos. And God says, no, I gave you your home so that I could mess it up with the lives of other people. Hallelujah. Can I hear an amen, somebody? Be careful. You just all said amen down there. I love you guys. Man, you're preaching, preaching at me. You know what? I really believe that anything that we give to God, He puts life into that thing. He puts His life. He puts His zoe into it. He puts His power into it. He puts His increase into it. And it's wonderful. So God's calling us as a church to not have a, a sparing spirit, but he's calling us to have a do not spare spirit. As a church, he's, he's calling us to, to stretch, to stretch, and to be willing to allow God to use us in ways he's never used you before. 
And fourthly here, it says, strengthen your stakes. A tent stake is the strengthening, the strengthen, sorry, by being driven deeper into the ground. The stake is the anchor point to which the cord connects the tent. Without a firm or strong stake, the tent will collapse. Our relationship with each other and with Jesus, hallelujah, are those stakes. The deeper our relationship with Jesus and others, the stronger the whole tent or church will be. And the further the curtains can spread from left to right. So let's go deeper with each other. Let's go deeper with Jesus, who's the anchor of our soul. The result will be strength in a time of enlarging, stretching, and lengthening, so that many more can be covered by the gospel of grace. Listen, when I think about a, a peg going into the ground, I've camped a lot. I went to Boy Scouts, believe it or not, camped in all kinds of crazy spaces and places, and... Uh, even taught my boys how to uh, camp and set up a tent in Africa near the Kruger National Park. And um, I've learned something about stakes and tents and ropes and stretching out from a natural point. When you drive a stake into a gr in the ground in order to support the tent as an anchor point, even if the, there's a good amount of peg in the ground or stake in the ground, if the wind gets up, and the peg's not hammered all the way in. So there's just a little nub at the top. You shouldn't even be able to see any of that stake or peg. It should be completely in the ground. One is I've torn my foot on a stake as it's been nighttime. I've been walking around the tent. But more importantly than that, when the wind gets up, if the, if the rope is at the top of the, of the stake and a big piece is sticking out, there's something called leverage that begins to happen against that stake. As the wind prevails, as the rain comes down, and as uh, 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 the elements begin to persistently blow, what happens is the, 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 the peg starts to bend. Or if it's wooden, it'll start to crack and eventually it'll break or it'll just get lifted out of the ground completely. And the Bible gives these examples, not randomly, but very intentionally. And so when we talk about driving a stake into the ground, what we're actually talking about is driving our own lives into the ground of God, into the presence of God of God, into the household of faith, into the placement of the Lord, into the relationships ordained for you. You can't expect somebody else to bring a hammer to your life and drive you into the ground. You need to drive yourself into that ground. And that's where that wait and see spirit can really hurt us is let's not be fenced it is to say, maybe in this church situation, I'm going to wait and see to see if we succeed. If you wait and see to see if we succeed, we will not succeed. Because a wait and see spirit is a spectator spirit. God has not called us to be spectators. He's called us to be participators. So when we announce things like, hey, come to a, uh, an Angels game, believe me, it's not for an Angels fan. It's for a City Life Church fan so that we can get to know one another. Every Wednesday night, i am now open my home for anybody who wants to come to our home just to hang out with Jenny and I and with each other where we can worship together, we can pray together, and we can play together. We can have fun together. We can enjoy one another, get to know one another. And every time we do that Wednesday night moment, guess what? The stake gets deeper into the ground. Every time we say yes to being used by the Lord in our sphere of influence, the stake gets driven deeper into the ground. Every time we say, God, I don't want to just be a part of your house. I want to be one who was connected in and who is supplying every joint supplying into the house. That stake goes in even deeper. Every time you give of your resources to the house, your stake goes in even deeper. Can I hear an amen, somebody? 
You are not your own. You were bought with a price. You belong to Jesus. And He is the head of the church. And you are His body. We don't get to decide what we do and what we don't do. Jesus has made some choices for us and for our lives. Hallelujah. Anybody agree with that? It's not about what I choose to do or don't choose to do. It's about what God has predestined me to do. It's about me fulfilling His plan, being faithful with the sphere of influence that He's given to me by relying on the finished work of Jesus to empower me to love people, to empower me to be more concerned about others than about myself. And as I focus on Him and stop focusing on me, I tell you what will begin to happen is I'll start to love people more. You know, many of us read the Bible like narcissists. I'll tell you what I mean by that. We believe that the, all the Scripture is about us. So we approach the Bible to find ourselves a cure to our common problem, a cure to our financial situation, a cure to a habit that we have, a cure to some situation, a promise here, a principle there, or whatever. My friend, if we keep on doing that, we are the center of our own universe. And that is not what God wants for you. Yes, there are promises and principles in the Bible, but those are the cherry on the top. The substance and the essence of the Word of God is Jesus. He is the point of all Scripture. He is the center of all of it. And so if you come to the Word of God expecting to find a few principles for breakthrough, you will diminish the finished work of Jesus in your life. It is through recognizing who He is and what He's done that we get breakthrough. It's through knowing Jesus that we experience life. When the Bible says, in whom the Son sets free, that one is free indeed. You didn't free yourself through truth. You got free because you recognized Jesus has already set you free. So when I come to the Bible, or when I come to church, or when I'm involved in everything, when I'm with my children, or when I'm with my wife, or when I'm in my car, wherever I am in this life, it's not I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The emphasis is on I. It's not about I. It should be read like this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And in America and in many parts of the world, the focus is on I, 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 me, mine, I, I. It's not about you. You died. It's about Christ and about other people that He wants you to love and minister to and be used by and experience the thrill of God flowing through your life on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday. Come on, church. That's what life really is about. And the more you chase happiness, the more it will elude you. It's The American dream is the American illusion. It is. Why? Because that's not a dream that will make you happy. It's the dream of Jesus that will make you happy. That's where the life is. That's where the joy is. That's where the power is. That's where the grace is. That's where the love is. That's where the goodness is. That's where the miracles are. That's where the significance is. It's in Christ. Next week, I'm going to talk about the road. I'm going to talk about the road to Emmaus. I'm going to talk about how Jesus reveals Himself to His disciples. And I want to talk about how God wants you to recognize Scripture and see Scripture differently and read the Bible differently. Stop going to it for problems. Start going it to that Bible for the prince, not your problems. Start finding Jesus in the pages of Scripture. And the more you see Him, the more you will want Him. And the more you'll want Him, the more you'll have Him. Because those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they're going to be fulfilled. They're going to be satisfied. Not any old righteousness. God's free gift of righteousness to you by faith. Can you stand to your feet this morning? Once again, Pastor James Monaghan would like to thank you for listening to this message from City Life Church in Orange County, California. For more information, please visit our website at www.citylifeoc.com.